Full time and I'll station. <laughs> no, no. Recording in progress. So, Maharaj's lecture is streamed online as well on YouTube as well as Facebook. So, all devotees, I would like to briefly give introduction of Maharaj to all of you. Uh, no Maharaj, but I will briefly speak about him for my own purification. Today, we are very honored that we have with us His Holiness. Bhakti Vigna Vinashak Narsim Maharaj. Haribo. Maharaj is Srila Prabhupada's disciple. He joined this con London in 1971 and he got first initiation from Srila Prabhupada in 1972. Since then, Maharaj has been very exemplary. His lifestyle and his sadhana is very exemplary and inspiring. Uh, and seeing his dedication, uh, he was awarded sannyas initiation in 1994 and after sannyas uh, he has been very actively preaching in many countries around the world especially in india philippines china taiwan singapore hong kong malaysia thailand and many such places and maharaj has been uh, maharaj is very accessible and uh, maharaj offers personal guidance and deep inspiration to thousands of devotees around the world we see here that Sanatan Goswami, when he met Haridas Thakur, <clears throat> he said, My dear Haridas, I have seen in this world some people mm, preach very well, but their behavior is not very good. And some people, their behavior is very good, but they do not preach. But you are exemplary because your behavior is exemplary and your preaching is also wonderful. And same is true about Maharaj. Maharaj is very exemplary in his uh, lifestyle and his practice of Krishna. Also, he's a very active preacher. And one of his special qualities is that he walks his talk. And he's also uh, very instrumental in developing Mayapur Institute in uh, Mayapur. He has been teaching in Mayapur Institute since its inception. He teaches Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhu, and Bhakti Vedanta courses. He's also initiating spiritual master in ISKCON. And every year, Maharaj participates in Mayapur festival and government of Parikrama. And he also visits Calcutta every year. But due to Corona, he has not visited Calcutta in the last two years. But he has been very kind and merciful to us that uh, he has given his merciful session through Zoom. And today also, we are very honored and very grateful that uh, he has agreed to give his valuable session to us on, online today. So let us welcome His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinashat Narsimha Swami Maharaj by loudly chanting three times. Haribo! 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 Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your glorification. I don't know if I can live up to everything you said, but <laughs> anyway. You are already living, Maharaj, and we are deeply inspired by you. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narotamam Daivim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudirat Nasta Prais Papadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloki Bhakti Bhavati Nishtaki So we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam chapter number 35 of the 10th canto entitled The Gopis Sing of Lord Krishna as he wanders in the forests of Vrindavan. And this morning we're reading text 20 to 23 and the verse on the board is text number 22. So we'll chant text number 22 first. Vatsalo Brajagavam Yad Agadro Vandyamana charana pati vridhai 
ಕೃತ್ಸ್ನಘೋತನಂ ಉಪೋಯತಿ ನಂತೆ ಕೀರ್ತಿ ಅಫೆಕ್ಷನೆಟ್ ಬ್ರಜ ಗವಂ to the cows of braja yat because aga of the mountains dra the lifter vandyamana being worshiped charana his feet pati along the path vridai by the exalted demigods krishna entire godanam the herd of cows upoya collecting dina of the day ante at the end gita venu playing his flute anuga by his companions edita praised kirti his glories so this text number 22 i'll just read the translation of that uh which is put together with text number 23 so I'll, maybe we'll go back first of all because we're beginning from text number 20 i'll read the translation of text 20 and 21 and then we'll come and read text 22 and 23 so 20 and 21 says o sinless yashoda your your darling child the son of maharaj nanda his festive has festively enhanced his attire with a jasmine garland and he is now playing along the yamuna in the company of the cows and cowherd boys amusing his dear companions the gentle breeze honors him with its soothing fragrance of sandalwood while the various upadevas standing on all sides like panigairists offer their music singing and gifts of tribute purport shila jiva goswami explains that the gopis are again in the courtyard of mother yashoda the queen of braja they are trying to encourage her by describing krishna's return to vrindavan after he has spent the day herding cows and playing Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti comments that the Upadevas, the minor demigods mentioned here, include the Gandharvas who are famous for their celestial music and dancing. Now the translation of text 22 and 23. Out of great affection for the cows of Braja, Krishna became the lifter of Govardhan Hill. At the end of the day having rounded up all his own cows he plays a song on his flute while exalted demigods standing along the path worship his lotus feet and the cowherd boys accompanying him chant his glories his garland is powdered by the dust raised by the cow's hoofs and his beauty enhanced by his fatigue creates an ecstatic festival for everyone's eyes eager to fulfill his friend's desires krishna is the moon arisen from the from the womb of mother yashoda purport according to the acharyas at this point the gopis climbed 
into the watchtowers of Vrindavan's houses so they could see Krishna as soon as possible when he returned home. Mother Yashoda was very anxious for her son to come back and therefore she had the tallest of the beautiful young gopis climb up to see when he would arrive. It is implied here that Krishna was somewhat delayed on the way home because his lotus feet were being worshipped by great demigods along the path. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chatsurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachadesha Tarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're hearing about the wonderful activities of the cowherd ladies of Braja, the gopis. Actually, they're young girls rather than ladies. Young ladies, we could say, young, young girls, actually. And they appear, they, they have appeared in, on this earthly planet just after Lord Krishna. So they're, they're younger than Krishna. And uh, these gopis are not ordinary girls, the, but they're all very special souls who've taken birth in Vrindavan just to take part in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna has many, many devotees from different places. We have the eternal, eternally liberated devotees who come from the spiritual world to take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes. Gopis like Srimati Radharani and uh, Chandravali and uh, the, uh, well, uh, 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 Champakalata, Chitra, Champakalata, uh, Vishaka, Lalita, Tunga Vidya, Induleka, Rangadevi, Sudevi, these people, these are the Astasakis, and then other, so many other gopis came. So you have the eternally liberated gopis, and you have also those gopis who have just become liberated. They're souls who are just going back to Godhead. They've been in the material world and they've been undergoing purification and performing different austerities and they've come to the platform of taking birth as gopis in Vrindavan and taking part in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Jiva Goswami tells us that before we can go back to Godhead, we have to first of all take a birth somewhere in this material world where Lord Krishna is performing his pastimes and take part in Krishna's pastimes in the earthly lila. And in this, this way become more qualified to enter into Krishna's pastimes in the spiritual world. So you have gopis who are uh, just become perfect. Then you have other gopis like uh, the, the sages from Dandakaranya, Dandakaranya sages who, who had been attracted by Lord Ramachandra 
and they saw the beauty of Lord Ramachandra and they were attracted to have an amorous relationship in the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra. But Lord Ramachandra had vowed only one wife. So he told them, you take birth as gopis and then in my next incarnation you can have that kind of relationship with me. So you have the sages from Dandakaranya appearing in the families of the cowherd people in Braja. And you have also the personified Vedas. The personified Vedas were also desiring to see Krishna's pastimes. And initially they came and uh, just they thought just simply by their own piety they could take birth in Krishna's pastimes. But then they learned that they would have to actually take birth in the family of the cowherd people and become gopis and then they could actually take part in Krishna's pastimes. So you have those Shruti Charas, the personified Vedas, who come also in Krishna's pastimes. So in this way you have many different groups of gopis who are all coming to take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes. And they're all very, very special souls who have very deep love for Krishna. And this chapter particularly is telling us how they absorb themselves in thinking of Krishna constantly. It didn't matter what they were doing, but they were always chanting the glories of Krishna. The gopis would be very busy. It wasn't they didn't do anything. They had many duties to do. They had to clean the house, they had to milk the cows, some of them had babies, they had to take care of their children. Uh, you know, young ladies in the village, they're very busy, they're very active. They, the, the, the men depend on them to take care of the home, to keep the home clean. And, to, and there's no question of going to the supermarket to purchase things. And they didn't keep things in the fridge. So they would go out every day and they'd have to get the food from whatever was growing around in the fields, they'd gather the vegetables and some like that, and they would, then they would have to prepare the food. And to prepare the food, that's also done on, they would have probably cow dung, gober to cook on, maybe coal fires, I don't know, sometimes, but usually be gober. They would cook on the fuel which was available there. So in this way the gopis were so busy, but all the time they were constantly chanting the glories of Lord Krishna. They were always singing, they were always doing Sankirtan, because they were always chanting these wonderful songs about Lord Krishna. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu attract people to Krishna consciousness? Just simply by his singing beautiful songs about Lord Krishna. Wherever he went, he would be singing about Krishna and people would be attracted. When they would have Ratyatra, we hear Lord Chaitanya telling Swarup Damodar to sing. And Swarup Damodar would sing a, a song. Nobody could understand the meaning, only Lord Chaitanya could understand. And because Swarup Damodar, would, he would sing a song about Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's pastime, his lila with the gopis. And ordinary people, they could not understand the significance, but Lord Chaitanya would know. And when Swarup Damodar would sing, Lord Chaitanya would feel great ecstasy. So this, this was going on in Rathiyatra. And they were they were just simply reenacting what was going on in Braja during the time of Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna appeared in Braja, all the people in Braja, they were all great souls, very special devotees who'd come. Some of them came before Krishna, some of them came after Krishna. I was telling the gopis came after Krishna. Before Krishna, you have people like Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, Vasudev, Devaki, and you have all, all of these kind, and the older gopi ladies. So they all appeared before Krishna, and then you have the, the cowherd boys who are coming about the same time as Lord Krishna, 
Lord Balaram comes just a, a little before Krishna. In this way, they're all there to be with Lord Krishna in Vrindavan and to take part in the pastimes. So Krishna has his three different leelas. He has the leela as a young child when he's at home in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj. It's with his mother and that's where Damada leela takes place during that time. And then as he grows up a little bit, then he's sent into the forest with the calves. He goes with the calves every day and the cowherd boys also go with him. They all go together and they take the calves with them. So this was like five, from the age of five up to the age of 10, Krishna was doing this. And then once he comes to the age of 10, then Krishna is a bit grown up now and he's a bit older and he can take the cows. And when Krishna was between five and 10, then the Leela is more concerned with Krishna, with the cowherd boys. But as he grows up a little bit, then it's more with the gopis. And we hear more about the pastimes with the gopis. So here, uh, we're hearing, in this particular chapter, we're hearing about the, the mood of the gopis and how they sing wonderful songs glorifying the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And they sing about Lord Krishna's activities, going to the forest, because they would know what they would hear from the other, the other cowherd boys, how this demon came, tried to steal the cows, or tried to steal a cowherd boy. They would hear about the different activities and how Krishna dealt with the different demons when they came, one after another. And of course, they'd seen Putana. They'd seen, when Krishna was a little baby, of course, many of the cowherd boys and gopis, they would also be little children at that time. But they would hear about it from their parents as they grew up. They would hear that there was this big demon, that she came in the form of a gopi, and then she was actually a big rakshasi, and she tried to poison Krishna. So the gopis would hear about all of these different leelas, and they would sing about it. And here in the verse today, we're hearing about Krishna picking up the Govardhan hill. And of course, this was enacted when Krishna was what? It was it seven years old when Krishna picked up the Govardhan hill? And he, yes. So he was only seven. So that's, he was with the cowherd boys. But at the same time, part of the purpose of the Govardhan Leela is that Krishna has an opportunity to be with all the gopis because the gopis are regretting that Krishna is going out every day to the forest. They, and they would see him go off every morning. They would hear Krishna wake up in the morning and Krishna after taking bath and dressing, then he would blow on his flute, blow on his conch, uh, what was it, blow a buffalo horn. And you call all the cowherd boys and they would all come running to be with Krishna because they knew Oh, it's time to go to the forest. And Mother Yashoda, she's prepared the lunch box for Krishna to take with him. Of course, all the cowherd boys, they also have to bring their own lunch boxes. And, and they all go off together. It's a big festival. And all the gopis, they would, they would be watching Krishna go to the forest. They would want to see Krishna go. They want to, they want to use their eyes to see Krishna. Right? We have that beautiful verse in the Gopi Gita uh, where the gopis pray that what kind of creator is this Brahma, this stupid Brahma, and that, that he created these eyes which blink and they obstruct our vision of Lord Krishna. So even to lose sight of Krishna for a moment was so painful for the gopis. And therefore, every day they would watch, in feeling great anxiety and great pain of the, the coming separation, as they would watch Krishna go off into the Vrindavan forest with all the cowherd boys and with the calves. And the gopis would, they would watch as he, they, they would follow him part of the way until he got into the deep forest. They would be following him. They didn't want to go back. 
They wanted to follow him. They wanted to see him more and more. But then they had their own duties to do, so they have to come back. And they have so many responsibilities, their daily chores to perform. So they have to rush back and do all their chores. And then throughout the day they're remembering Krishna and they're thinking of Krishna. And they're thinking of Krishna walking on all the, the stones and the thorns. And they're thinking how his, his feet are so tender that these stones and thorns must be piercing Krishna's feet. So the gopis are singing about all, all of these things described in Gopi Gita like that. So here also in this chapter the gopis are remembering Lord Krishna and his wonderful activities and they're meditating on Lord Krishna coming home in the evening and they're so anxious, when is he going to come, when is he going to come, they're waiting. They see, they see the sun gradually sink, gradually go down, and they know it's time. Krishna must be coming home soon. He must be coming back soon. And they're so anxious that they send a gopi to climb up on the top of the building to look. Is Krishna coming yet? Can you see him yet? So we're, we're told how uh, the gopis are trying to comfort Mother Yashoda because Mother Yashoda, she's also very anxious for her son to come home. And she's also uh, preparing everything. Of course, usually it would be Srimati Radharani who would cook for Krishna. Mother Yashoda would invite Srimati Radharani to come and prepare Krishna's evening meal. But still, Mother Yashoda is very, very anxious for her son to come home just to see him again because she knows so many troubles have come. Her son going into the forest, there were so many demons, different demons coming and giving them trouble. So she's always worried what's going to happen. And there was even the forest fire and Lord Krishna fought had to swallow the forest fire. So she's always in anxiety. What's going to happen today? Is there going to be another demon? Is there going to be another fire? Oh, will Krishna come home? Will Krishna be saved? Because Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, they don't think of Krishna as God. And neither do the gopis or the cowherd boys. They simply think of Krishna as a cowherd boy. And they think of Krishna as the son of Nanda Maharaj. They don't think of Krishna in any other way. They're not thinking of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even though he's, they describe him here, he, he's the lifter of Govardhan Hill. But Mother Yashoda doesn't think Krishna could do it. She thinks, oh my son, he couldn't do it. It must have been my husband Nanda Maharaj was doing it helping him. You know, just like, you know, a little boy wants to do something, the father will help behind the back. So Mother Yashoda thinks like that. Oh, my son Krishna, come on, he's only a little child. How could he pick up the Govardhan Hill? It must have been the cowherd men who were all helping him. So in this way, the people of Vrindavan, headed by Mother Yashoda, and then all the gopis, they're so anxious. When is Krishna going to come home? And they're looking. Do you see the dust? Do you see the, the cows coming? They will raise some dust. Because Vrindavan is usually quite dry. So is there dust, is there dust in the air? Maybe that's them. Maybe they're coming. But we're told that the different demigods also come to receive Krishna. And in the one verse today, they talk about the Upadevas, minor demigods, which include the Gandharvas. And they've all come to greet Krishna also. And they're, they're greeting Krishna by playing their different musical instruments and singing and dancing. And in this way, just like a festival, 
And this, this is a daily occurrence. It's a festival because Krishna is coming. Just like we had a festival just here in Mayapur last week. Prabhupada is coming, right? The festival was Prabhupada is coming. So we, the same way every day in Vrindavan, Krishna is coming, Krishna is coming home. They would all come to see Krishna in the morning. They wouldn't want Krishna to go, but Krishna would go. They would see him off and they would be so anxious for him to come home again in the evening. And we're told Krishna was a little delayed because the different demigods were worshipping his lotus feet. Of course, these demigods, they would often conceal themselves and they, they would come in different forms. Just like we said, the, cow, the cowherd boys and the gopis are not ordinary souls, they're all great devotees. Similarly also the cows, Krishna's cows, are all very special souls. And Krishna knows the names of all of his different cows and he will call them by name when he plays on the flute. They will all respond. So these cows in Vrindavan are very special souls. And not only the cows, but all living entities in Vrindavan are very special souls. It is said the birds, just like here in Mayapur, we have so many birds. You can hear them cooing, coo, coo. <laughs> and and in the night we hear the jackals, wah, 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 <laughs> the jackals, so many sounds of the different, but they're all creatures, they're all dam vasis, they've taken birth in the dam. And in, in Braja, all of these different living entities, they're very special souls. Uh, the, in uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, it's also in Srimad Bhagavatam, you can read the glorification of the different living entities in Vrindavan. And they begin the glorification with the, with the clouds, that the clouds over Vrindavan are very glorious, that they're very special clouds, very pious, because they're sheltering Vrindavan and they're cooling the Vrindavan area by their shade. And then after glorifying the clouds, then they speak about the different rivers which flow there in Braja. They are also very, very special rivers. The water, the water of these rivers is very special, like nectar. And these rivers are actually also very pious, very great souls who are appearing for the pleasure of Krishna's pastime. Then you have the different trees and creepers and plants in Vrindavan. They are also very special souls. They've taken birth in Vrindavan just to beautify the land of Braja. Wonderful trees like Kadamba trees and Tamal trees. And then so many different creepers are growing there and bushes. That's why Uddhava prays that he could take his next birth. That he said, even if I have to become some plant, let it be in Vrindavan or just outside Vrindavan, so that I can get the dust from the feet of the great devotees. Just imagine how great these plants and grass are which grow in Vrindavan. They get the dust of the feet of all the great devotees who walk there. And then, after describing about the plants, then we hear about the birds. The, the, these birds are all great sages who have come to take part, to hear and to witness the pastimes of Lord Krishna. They're not ordinary living entities. And so the birds in the, in the dam, and then you have also, of course, uh, you have the animals, as well as the cows, you have the dogs and the pigs, 
and the jackals, right? Prabhupada talked about the, the pigs in Vrindavan. He said they were some fallen yogis who were taking their last birth before they go back to Godhead. So in this way we, we, we have to respect all the living entities in the Dham and understand they are not ordinary souls, that they have taken their birth there, very special souls. So the gopis are all anxious to see Krishna come home in the evening and they're watching, waiting for him to come. And Mother Yashoda, everyone's ready. And Krishna's a little delayed because the great demigods along the path are worshipping his lotus feet. So these demigods, they're very, they have big positions in the universe, but they're not pure devotees, usually. The demigods are mixed with some material desires. They're devotees, but they still have some material desires. But they take, they take the opportunity to come and worship the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna appears in his earthly pastimes, which is only once in a day of Brahma, the demigods, they want to take advantage. They take the opportunity to come because they understand this is some very special time. And they will come and worship his lotus feet. So how special is Lord Krishna that even the great demigods are coming and worshipping him. And Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, she, everyone wants to get the blessings of Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, Ordinary people are all worshipping Lakshmi for her blessings. But Lakshmi, she wants to get the blessings of the people of Vrindavan because she wants to somehow get into Krishna's Rasa Leela. But of course she can't do it because she's the goddess of fortune. It's not her position. She cannot just become a gopi. Hmm. She has to, but she was given the position to be a line on the chest of Lord Krishna and to reside there eternally. So the goddess of fortune, she worships the lotus feet of all the people of Vrindavan and she's very, very eager also to be in Vrindavan. She respects the holy land of Vrindavan and she comes here she came to Vrindavan and she performed her tapasya there in Vrindavan in order to try to get the mercy of Krishna. So these are some things about this uh, particular section which we've been hearing. Mm, Mother Yashoda was very anxious. Yes, Mother Yashoda is very anxious. The gopis naturally, they take care of the older ladies. Mother Yashoda's elderly lady, not a young lady, Nanda Maharaj was already grey-haired when he became the father of Lord Krishna. So it was quite a surprise for everyone in Vrindavan when Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj were blessed with a son. So naturally, like Mother Yashoda, who had been trying for a child for a long time and had never been, finally she got a son. So when she gets a son, naturally the affection, the attachment will be very, very strong. She had so much love for her son. Of course, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they're always Krishna's mother and father. And Krishna enjoys having the parental relationship with them, so that Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, whenever Krishna comes, they come to be his parents. Vasudev and Devaki, they could give birth to Krishna, but they couldn't witness all the pastimes of Krishna. The childhood Leela of Krishna, which is the most sweet, 
like Damodar Lila, that is only witnessed by Mother, Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj also to some extent. But mainly it's Mother Yashoda who enjoys these dealings and Krishna enjoys his loving affection which she has for him. Mother Yashoda therefore has so much love for Krishna that she's so anxious every day for her son to come home. And the gopis, they also have very deep, intense love for Krishna. The Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu declared the gopis to be the greatest devotees of Krishna. Why? Well, why even greater than Mother Yashoda? Because the gopis made sacrifices to show their love for Krishna. Mother Yashoda, she's Krishna's mother, so it was natural for her to be affectionate to Krishna and to have love for Krishna. But the gopis, many of them were married and some of them even had children, but they also have love of Krishna and they sacrifice everything for Krishna, even their chastity that they would, when Krishna would call them into the forest at the dead of night, they would all come running into the forest and they, they would be with Krishna to perform rasa lila. And so sometimes Krishna would play tricks with them, sometimes Krishna would call them and then he'd say to them, why you're coming here? You're young girls, you shouldn't come into the forest at night. And then Krishna would dance with them and then suddenly he would disappear because he would feel that the gopis are becoming a little proud, thinking they're with Krishna, so he would disappear from them. And so the gopis had to feel all of this, the pangs, the separation, the pain, you know, the, the loving relationship which they had with Krishna was so intense, so deep. So Mother Yashoda, she also has love for Krishna, but it, it's not like the gopis love for Krishna, because the gopis, they sacrificed everything. They gave up everything. Even they could leave, run out of their home, leave their husbands, leave their family members, just to come to be with Krishna. So this was the very special love which the gopis had for Krishna. And this is why they are considered the greatest devotees of Krishna. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes as Krishna himself. He wants to experience this mood of the gopis. He wants to develop this, he wants to experience this gopi bhava. The, this loving ecstasy which the gopis have for Krishna. Why? Because it's the greatest ecstasy. And Lord Krishna likes ecstasy. Lord Krishna is the, the greatest enjoyer. He wants to enjoy greater than anyone. We all like to enjoy. Krishna, why do we like to enjoy? Because Krishna likes to enjoy. And Krishna likes to enjoy to the supreme extent and that's why he had to come in the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because as Krishna himself he could not experience the ecstasy which the gopis have for Krishna. The special feeling which the gopis experience when they see the beauty of Krishna and then when they see how Krishna is attractive to them, then they feel even more ecstasy. So Lord Krishna, he cannot experience the ecstasy which they're experiencing. Of course, he, Lord Krishna is also attracted when he sees his own reflection and also bewilders his mind. But Still, the pleasure which he experiences is not like the pleasure which the gopis experience. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu understood that if he wanted to experience that ecstasy, he had to come 
in the mood of the gopis. Therefore he came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu he cultivated this mood, this gopi bhava. Along with his other associates like Swarup Damodar, Ramanandarai, Siki Mahiti, these kind of people who were all great souls from Krishna Leela who had come with him to help Lord Krishna who has come as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they came to help him to experience that Gopi Baba and to guide him in relishing that mood of the Gopis. So the mood of the Gopis is constant kirtan, as we said. Whatever they were doing, they were always chanting the glories of Krishna. Of course, sometimes it's mentioned that sometimes when they would be with elderly people, elderly gopis, they had to chant in their minds. Because the elderly gopis, if they would hear them, the young gopis chanting about Krishna, then they would think, oh, this is not good. Why are you singing about Krishna? You're a young girl and you're, you're married. He's not your husband. Why are you singing about him? So they, they, they had to be a little discreet about their relationship with Krishna. Otherwise, they'd be criticized by the elderly gopis. So they, they would sometimes, when they were with the, in the company of the elderly gopis, they would just chant the glories of Krishna in their mind or very softly to themselves. But they generally, they like to sing and chant when they're milking the cows, when they're cleaning the cow barn and collecting the cow dung and making cow putties, doing all of these things which the village girls has, have to do, they would be singing about Krishna and they would be very ecstatic and joyful because of associating with Krishna through song. So this is very important for us to learn we want to relish also the glories of Lord Krishna in song. And that's why Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Naratam Das, they wrote so many songs to make it easy for us to remember Krishna. You know, we're not all so poetic or so gifted that we could write one, but we have the, the benefit of these great Acharyas. They wrote all of these, all of these wonderful songs for us. And we, by singing these songs, then we can remember all the pastimes of Krishna. And this is the perfection of our life. In every age, there's a process. Just like in the Satya Yuga, the process was meditation. And by meditation, then they would come to the perfect stage of constant chanting of the Holy Name. And then in Treta Yuga, the process was yagna, yagna, doing sacrifices. And by sacrifice, they'd come to the perfect stage where they could constantly chant the holy name. And then in Dwapara Yuga, <coughs> they would do deity worship. And the result of deity worship, would, at the perfect stage, there would be constant chanting of the holy name. So now we're in Kali Yuga, and in Kali Yuga, we're not very qualified to do meditation or sacrifices or deity worship. We have to just simply chant the holy name. And by chanting the holy name, one day we will come to the perfect stage where we can constantly chant the holy name. That is the perfection of Krishna consciousness. Kirtaniya Sadahari, always chanting the holy name. So we learn from the pastimes of the gopis how to constantly chant the holy name. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, fix your mind on me and perform your duty, fighting. Krishna didn't tell Arjuna not to fight. He said, fix your mind on me and then perform your duty of fighting. So the same way the gopis, they're also, they've fixed their minds on Krishna and they're performing their duties, doing so many 
chores, different services, but doing everything in Krishna consciousness. That is their perfection. And they're appreciating the wonderful beauty of Krishna. Krishna's beauty is so overwhelming, so inconceivable. They describe how uh, his, uh, his cheerful face is resembling the moon. Oh, that's the next verse. Oh, I shouldn't go on to that. What did we come? It was describing today, we heard about his beauty enhanced by his fatigue. You know, when we get tired, you know, we'll become really ugly. I don't know about you, but I know I, I'm horrible, you know. When you get tired, you know, miserable, oh, tired, miserable. But Krishna, his beauty is enhanced by his fatigue. This is the nature of Krishna. And his garland is powdered by the dust from the cow hooves. It's all so attractive. Everything about Krishna is so attractive to the devotees of Krishna. His playing on the flute is so wonderful. It enchants living entities all over the creation. Not just simply the cows, not just simply the gopis, all over the creation. Even the demigods flying in their airplanes, when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they become stunned. When the calf is drinking milk from the udder of the cow and he hears the sound of Krishna's flute, they become stunned and they stop drinking and tears come from their eyes. This is their reactions, hearing the sound of Krishna's flute. And the exalted demigods are along the path, worshipping his lotus feet. Of course, as I said, these demigods, they may come in different forms. They may come as the birds, they may come as the different animals along the path. But they're all worshipping the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. So this is the beauty of Vrindavan Dham. All right, we will stop here. Well, maybe there's some questions or comments. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much. Such a nectarian description of Krishna and his wonderful pastimes. Gopi's love for Krishna and Yeshoda's love for Krishna. You can take some questions. Uh, devoted to those who have questions, you can raise hands. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, please. Voice is not clear. Maybe those who want to ask question can come near the computer and then ask. So it's clear. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for such a nice class. Uh, you are explaining that uh, about different Vrindavan uh, uh, Vasis. Uh, proper said that you know, uh, uh, it picks in Vrindavan or in Naudrip, you know, cattle or the different, different kind of animals. You know, you explained that uh, you know, it's a fallen yogi or something like that. You know, some proper said that you know, they get an opportunity to take birth in, birth in Vrindavan and like that. So, in this context, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, know from you, hear from you that, like, uh, 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 you know, when a living entity he leaves the body, you know, yeah, uh, are there any indications by which he can understand that what kind of uh, body he may get, especially devotees, you know, uh, what kind of body he may get in the next lifetime? Are there any indications by which uh, he or she can understand? Oh, I don't, I don't myself know of any exact definite indications of what kind of body a person is going to take. We just simply know that from the consciousness which the person has, maybe the consciousness which he portrayed throughout his life and the consciousness of which he has at the time of leaving the body, then we can understand this is some indication of what will be his next life. 
but as far as any direct implication of what kind of body he's going to get, I don't know. Just simply, we know, whatever from Bhagavad Gita, the law, whatever we remember at the end of life, then you will, that state you will attain without fail. And so at the end of life, even if one is not able to remember Krishna, because one, you know, not, we may have some unfortunate circumstances in dying. Uh, for example, you know, you may, be, you may not even be conscious, you may ha have to leave the body in an unconscious state. So uh, then, if the devotee had actually dedicated his life to Krishna, then Krishna will make arrangements. So devotees completely surrender to Krishna. It's Krishna who delivers the devotee. And Krishna takes care of the devotee. Where the devotee is going to take his birth, that's up to Krishna. The devotee doesn't put demands that I want to take this kind of birth. Of course, we, we, I told you about Uddhava and, uh, and, and Lord Brahma also that they were saying, you know, take, I want to have some, get the blessings of Vrindavan. But generally we don't make demands, you know, we're, we're very much surrendered to Krishna. What is Krishna's desire? Krishna, wherever you want to put me, I am yours. Just please engage me in your service. So, that is, I think, the, the mood which we want to have. We didn't hear from Śrīla Prabhupāda about any particular aspiration. We just simply want to get the blessings of the devotees. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, even if you may become a dog, let it be in the home of a devotee. So things like this, we uh, we heard about Gorky Shordas Babaji. He wanted to have his body dragged through the streets of Navadvip, but of course Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati would not allow that. He said this is that was just his humility, and he doesn't. It shouldn't. It should not be done. That he's a great soul, and we should put his body in samadhi. But where we will take our next birth? We just, we just surrender to Krishna. We just give our life to Krishna and then it, if, we've given our, if we've given our life to Krishna, then the next life we, we're, we're pretty sure Krishna will take care of us. He'll keep us engaged according to our qualification, according to our propensities. He'll find some way to engage us, to put us into some situation where we can continue to do some service. And maybe go back to Godhead. You know, in Buddhism they have these things about great souls, like when they burn the body of a Buddhist master, they get some bone from the back there, and this bone in the back, they can see from this bone, oh, they say, oh yeah, he's a, he got liberation, he got nirvana or something. You know, <laughs> that's how they do it in Buddhism. So somebody asked me, what, what about Krishna Consciousness? And Prabhupada also talks about great yogis that they can drive the life air out the top of the head and there will be a hole in the skull where the life air goes out the top of the head. And he said, this is the sign of a great yogi. But for devotees, uh, it's, it, this is not so... This is not the mood. We don't hear about this for devotees. No. We do have the disappearance of some great devotees like Naratam Das Thakur. His body became milk when he was taking bath in the Ganga. He took Dud Samadhi, right? And then you have uh, uh, Shamananda. He entered into the deity. Just as Lord Nichananda, Lord Chaitanya also, they entered into the deity. So these kind of things are there. 
there are some special samadhis, very special devotees. You know, Naratam Das, he took Dud Samadhi. What does it mean? <laughs> where, does his, where does he take his next birth? His body became milk in the Ganga, so where did he go in his next life? Again, we'd have to speculate about that. Where, where did he go? Is he going to take birth again in the material world or is he going to go back to Godhead? It doesn't matter. He's going to be fully engaged in Krishna's service wherever he goes because he, said he was such a pure devotee that wherever he goes he will be continuing his service to Krishna. That is the main thing. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Wonderful answer. Maharaj, you are saying that there are many rivers in Vrindavan and you are describing the Vrindavan. We only heard about uh, Yamuna. You are describing that how uh, birds and jackals and dogs and how clouds of Vrindavan and uh, so many. So you are describing uh, river. There are many rivers in Vrindavan. Well, not only rivers, but there are different cones and, you know, reservoirs of water. We see, we see these different reservoirs of water which are there, you know, all around Vrindavan. There's so many different reservoirs of water. So they're also very special. You know, we have Radakund, of course, and, but there's so many others. So many other places, Bindu, Sarova, and, and different places. But they're all very special. Uh, uh, Maharaj, you said that our uh, Chetramabu, he entered the deity of this Tota Gopinath. And uh, what about Nityapu? Which deity he entered? Who? Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu entered Bankim uh, Rai in Eka Chakra. In Ekchapra, okay. Anybody have any other question? What is? It's a very rare occasion to get Maharaj. So now, of course, it's the holy month of Damodar. You know, uh, Dr. Pataka Swami Maharaj asked Prabhupada one time about Damodar month, about significance of Damodar for us. And Prabhupada told him, he said, he said, for devotees, he said, this is not, not anything very special. He said, we continue our usual sadhana. Of course, we also chant Damodar song now. And, but he said, he said, actually, the, the month of Damodar is like a, just like a store will have a sale. And the idea of the sale is to bring in new customers. And they will have special goods, discount prices, bargain offers, and they try to get new customers. But we're regular customers in the store of devotional service. But the idea is we have to bring in new customers. So this is the real purpose of the month of Damodar. It's a very, very good time to bring in new people to Krishna consciousness. And if, if we give people the chance to offer the lamp to Damodar, it's very good for them. It destroys sinful reactions. Just by offering one light to Lord Damodar can destroy so many sinful reactions. And that can help to make people more pious and more eligible for accepting Krishna consciousness. So we should think about that, how we can introduce Krishna consciousness, how we can give people uh, a chance to offer a lamp to Damodar and get, let them come and participate in Krishna consciousness. And so many devotees, many like in the Middle East and also in Malaysia and different South India and so on, devotees are going around and they're, they're, they're giving out the information about Lord Damodar and they, they go to their homes and they'll sing the song, Damodar song, and they'll get people in the home, everybody in the home to offer a lamp. In Malaysia, they're giving out ghee steaks to people. They prepared many, many ghee steaks and they give them out to people and they get them to offer like one a day, every day, and get them in the habit to do regular worship. So you can also think about how to do this, 
You know, of course, you just finished Durga Puja, <laughs> but now's, now's a good time to introduce Damodar Puja, right? Durga Puja is over, now I come to Damodar, right? Worship Lord Damodar and offer a light to Lord Damodar and get the real blessings. You know, you got your material blessings from Durga, now you can get spiritual blessings from Lord Damodar. So we should be thinking like that. Try to, try to make it uh, to give people access to Krishna consciousness. And this month is very, very auspicious. Of course, we have the Govardhan Puja and Diwali. Diwali time, people are in a festive mood. It's very nice, very nice, appropriate time get people to come to the temple, offer a light to Damodar. And even you can go outside in the street. We go out in the streets in Hong Kong, we do Harinam and we take a picture of Lord Damodar and we get people to stop in the street to come and offer a light. Like that. Meet people, introduce, tell them about this, this auspicious month and this custom of offering lamps to Lord Damodar. So that's my request to you. I'm sure there's many, many, yes. many people in Calcutta who can offer lights to Damodar. It will be very nice. You can give them a chance to create some piety. Okay. Yes, Maharaj, we do our best. Also, one devotee is uh, wanting to ask one question. Yes, okay. Chandrasekhar. Maharaj, you are talking about the, all the living entities in Dham, all are very special souls. So what is the meaning of Dham, Maharaj? I had heard the appearance places of the saintly persons, they also become Dham. Like Rupad appeared in Kolkata, then we chant Kolkata Dham ki jai. But about all the living entities in Calcutta, how should we see them? Or this became Dham after Rupad appeared, or this was Dham before Rupad also. So this thing. Well, I don't know about Calcutta Dam. I was speaking about Vrindavan Dam. Vrindavan Dam is, is what's glorified in the scriptures. Generally, though, Dam, holy places, wherever the Ganges flows, that's a holy place. So the Ganges also flows there in Calcutta. Yeah? And, and, the, and the, the question was raised, well, what about Ekachakra? Is Ekachakra also a dam? They said, yeah, because wherever the Pandavas resided, that's also a holy place. So Pandavas also had come to Ekachakra, they stayed there. So they made Ekachakra also a dam. So this is the, the dam. Mm. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Yudhisthira glor glorified Vidura, Natarvida Bhagavatas, Tirta Bhutta Swayam Vivo, Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani Swantastena Gadabrata. That wherever you go, you make it a holy place because you carry the Lord in your heart. And so it's the presence of the devotee that make a place holy. It's not just the place itself. Of course, Vrindavan Dham, there are so many great devotees residing there in Vrindavan Dham. It is a very special place, it is a very holy place. And because of its, the, the, the Yamuna is there and uh, all the places of Lord Krishna's pastimes are there. And so it's very, very, very special. And Calcutta also, because of Srila Prabhupada's birth there and because of his initial activities there, made it also a holy place. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati also was preaching there for some time. He met Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati there in Calcutta. So yeah, very special place. So taking importance of the Dham, it's not just the Dham, but it's the people who reside in the Dham. Not everybody, you see, for their other, you said so many people in the dam, are they all residents of the dam? They don't realize they're in the dam, that's the problem. They're, these people are all covered, they cannot see the dam. Just like many people in Vrindavan, they're in Vrindavan, but they don't see the dam as a holy place. They can't see the real dam. You have to be in Krishna consciousness to actually see the dam. 
Prabhupada said, you don't enter the dam just by buying a ticket to go there. You have to, you have to actually have that consciousness. Just like Akrura entered Vrindavan Dam, and, he, and Prabhupada said, this is how you enter the dam. When Akrura came to the dam, he saw Krishna's footprints, then he, he rolled in the dust of the dam, took the dust all over his body. Prabhupada said, this is how you enter the dam. And so you have to have that right consciousness to be able to see the dam. So dam is not just some place on the map. It's not just a, a town or a, a place on the map. We have to understand. It's the consciousness which we have when we enter in that place that we can actually feel the presence of Krishna. Okay? Okay. Okay, Ma. Thank you very much. We are extremely grateful for your wonderful association and such nice nectar in Krishna Katha. So thank you very much. Thank Maharaj. you. So let us thank Maharaj for his valuable, wonderful, beautiful.